Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I finished my first imaging session. How do you think it went? Am I kicking myself for not doing this a year ago, or did I grab my cable and run outside in a panic? Stay tuned for the answers. So this is the setup I went with. It's my Ace PC AK-1. Don't buy this PC. It only has two USB 3 ports. I went ahead and bought an Anchor USB 3 hub, and I used that to uh, plug the external antenna, Wi-Fi antenna in here, and a 64 gigabyte thumb drive for easy data portability after the imaging session is over. And then on the main unit down here, of course, I've got the hub plugged into one of the USB 3 ports, and then the ultimate power box coming down from the telescope will plug into the second of the two USB 3 ports. And so that is what this setup looks like. I'm putting the computer inside this sealed box to protect it from dew. I know a lot of you mount your PCs on the telescope itself, which is nice if you can do that. In my case, I have to disassemble everything uh, when I want to change scopes and reassemble on a different uh, scope. And so it's just handier for me uh, to put the PC in the box and protect it from the environment. And it doesn't save much in terms of, of complexity. I only have two cables coming down, the power cable going up and the data cable coming back down. All that putting the PC on the telescope would do is add weight to the telescope and eliminate one cable. So it's not that big of an advantage in my particular case. And then I run the antenna outside through one of the holes in the box and set the antenna on top to maximize Wi-Fi signal detection. And then all the power is coming from the house current. And then finally, I use Windows Remote Desktop to uh, tie in to the remote PC to control, to start and control the session. So that's what I'm going with. It seems to be working okay. And for this first imaging session with the Explore Scientific ED-102, I'm going to be going after the lobster claw, which is about to disappear for the year, and try to capture the pair of galaxies, M81 and M82. So that's the plan. For the advanced sequencer setup, it's kind of the usual suspects. We've got the start session series of tasks that it performs to cool the camera and unpark the scope, and then we have the two targets, SHG-157 and M8182. But it's this end of session that I've modified now that I'm using a mini PC, and I'm going over here to the external script, and as part of this end of session parallel script that I've got going, I stop the guiding, warm the camera, park the scope, but I also execute this batch file using this external script command, which is actually very handy because it allows me to take all of the images that I create through the night and copy them from the drive on the PC to the thumb drive, the G drive. And in this case, I'm using the slash V option here to tell Windows to verify that the file you just copied is an exact replica of the file that's on the D drive. And so that is what the slash V does. It ensures that I'm getting good data, the files are being transferred properly. Then I copy the .txt files. In this case, these .txt files here are the PhD2 guide logs, which I'm having PhD2 save in this particular directory. Then I copy the JSON files from the NINA autofocus runs that are done throughout the night. And I'll show you those in a minute. They actually proved to be useful, uh, not just for checking focus, but for another reason. And I've got the NINA logs that I the .log files that I also copy over and the GSS logs I copy as well. And finally, the Ultimate Power Box saves off some fairly useful diagnostic and environmental information related to current, power, humidity, temperature, etc. And so I copy all those. Now what Pegasus Astro does is saves all of those files and uh, pictures in a subdirectory. So I'm using the slash s command to make sure when it goes into this directory above, the upbv2 directory, it's copying all of the subdirectories and the files in those directories over to the uh, G drive. Another thing that you have to do here if you're going to use one of these scripts, you'll notice that in this particular file name, Pegasus space Astro is used in the in the directory up above the upbv2 directory. And of course, DOS, uh, Windows, does not like, on the command line, does not like a space in the file name. So that's where you have to use these quotes at the end to make sure that you get the proper directory name in the uh, in the command here. And it takes about 15 minutes for a full night's worth of imaging to copy all the files over to the G drive. But once I come back to the computer in the morning, I can simply turn off the mini computer, power it down, 
and all of the files from the previous night's imaging are on the thumb drive and I just have to pull that off and take that over to one of my main computers for storage and processing. How do you think it went? Well, on the first night, things got started off okay. I logged uh, out of RDP once I saw that everything was working, images were coming in, uh, everything was, the PhD2 was guiding, everything looked fine. And But when I logged back in, I found that GSS had crashed. It was no longer visible. And of course, when GSS crashes, Nina and PhD2 can't talk to your mount. You're not doing any guiding. So that's a, uh, that's a big problem. One of the things that I did before this imaging session was update the version of GSS to the latest one that just came out. Previous to this, I had been using uh, the earlier version. Well, I restarted everything and it seemed to work for a while. I kept my eye on it and then logged out of the remote desktop app again. And I'll be darned if an hour or two later when I checked it, it had failed again. So this first night was a very bumpy one. I didn't get much good data. I decided on the second night that I would go back to the previous version of GSS. I also decided that I would not log out of remote desktop. I'll just leave it connected to the mini PC and everything worked just fine. You don't want to have to deal with clouds in the middle of an imaging session, but in this case, I think it was actually useful because it forced me to work with this remote computer to shut down an imaging session, park the scope, and then come back a couple of hours later after the clouds had cleared and start it back up again. And so that actually worked quite easily. So there was no issue at all working with this remote computer and, and that gave me a lot of confidence that yeah this this remote pc thing can work the wi-fi signal was strong i never lost any contact for any significant amount of time on the third and the fourth nights again everything worked just fine why didn't i do this sooner it's a, this is an awesome idea and then i tried the fifth night and absolutely nothing worked on the fifth night first of all i had difficulty even getting to the target it wouldn't move in the general direction of the target, do a plate solve, and then want to adjust its position, but then it wouldn't move, at the mount wouldn't move after that. And then I, I found I was dealing with a very intermittent Wi-Fi signal. It would, it would be losing every other second, and GSS would not stay connected to the mount. And so finally, I just threw up my hands, gave up, and grabbed the cable and plugged it in and everything worked fine after that. So I was able to salvage a night of imaging, but I had a lot of questions left over. Even though I had a promising start, there's going to be some troubleshooting required to figure out what the heck was going on here because I thought I had solved it in those middle three nights of good imaging. Let's talk about that pointing error problem I was having. This was actually reminiscent of a problem I was having a couple of weeks ago. And I think with the information and the new experience I had just recently, I think I now understand what was happening a couple of weeks ago, whereas before it was still a bit of a mystery. A couple of weeks ago, I was doing an imaging session and late in the night, it would slew to a target and then it would appear to just stop tracking. And when it stops tracking, you get a failure of the plate saw because it can't recognize what these star patterns are. And so it appeared uh, that I was getting to a particular location in the sky, in this case, the Orion Nebula at a particular time, which also means I was at a particular location on the worm gear. And it was just not tracking. It just The tracking just appeared to stop. And if you compare an image taken with the equatorial grid laid over that target, you can see that the streak is just occurring in the RA axis. It seems pretty clear that what's happening is that the mount is, the gears are turning, it is tracking, it's just that the clutch is slipping and it's not pointing the scope, it's not taking the scope with it as the gears turn. And this is a combination of, of kind of a stiff RA axis that I have and perhaps a particular location with the worm gear. What I did do is just really tighten that clutch lever much more so than I had been doing. That appeared to solve the problem. So for those of you who might be experiencing what you think is a loss of tracking, it might just be that your clutch is slipping and you might want to take a closer look at that. Now loss of the signal between the GSS and the mount is a different problem. And here's where the Nina's autofocus logs come in handy. As you saw in that batch file, I copy all of the JSON files and then I go through a separate analysis after each night to run through all of the focus curves that it did overnight. And you can see here, I use the color, the color of the line corresponds to the filter, and this is the black is the luminance, and the kind of this orangey color is the HA. In this case, it was just a, a night of luminance and HA. Curves look fine, that's not the point here. Take a look at the temperature. It starts off at about 1.8 C, and then ends in the morning around 2.8, minus 2.8 C. And things did not go that well that night. 
On the second night, when I thought I had solved the problem because I stayed connected to RDP and rolled back to a previous version of GSS, in fact, the temperatures ranged from positive 8 to positive 3C. The next good night, it was positive 13C to positive 4C. And then the third good night was positive 11C to 0.8C. And then on the night where everything blew up, I was at 0.8C down to minus 0.5C. Of course, by this time, I had gone to the USB cable right after that first autofocus run at, uh, at 0.5C. And if you take a look at the temperature ranges from each of these nights, I think it tells the important story. I think it is the smoking gun for the kind of problem I was having. On the first night, I was having, I got started okay, but then started having problems, apparently when the temperature dropped below about 1C or so. And then on the next three nights, everything seemed to be working, and I thought I had a solution when, in fact, it just happened to be that the air temperature outside was quite a bit warmer, and so I didn't have any problems. And then on the final night, when I was having problems right from the get-go, sure enough, the temperature started out at that troubling spot below about 1 degree C. Okay, so let's take a look at the observations from this imaging session. I found that the problem I thought I was having with the tracking issue was actually the clutch slipping. So one thing you really want to do is tighten those deck and RA clutches, particularly when there has been or is going to be a fairly significant temperature drop since the last time you set the clutch. Because as the temperature drops, metal components will shrink, will contract with the reduction in temperature. And now the grip that you used to have with the clutch at a higher temperature you don't have at a lower temperature. I found that the remote system uh, really worked well when it worked. I gained some confidence with the Wi-Fi signal stability and the remote desktop app. Uh, I think the advanced sequencer external script option is a nice way to get the data off of the remote computer and onto a portable storage device like the thumb drive that I'm using. I did encounter a PC temperature sensitivity problem with this HPC AK1 uh, PC. When the temperature drops below about one degree C, the port and bus connections seem to become flaky and I get a flaky, an intermittent Wi-Fi signal and I lose connection, GSS loses connection with the mount. So it turns out this is not a mount issue, it's not a green swamp server uh, latest release issue, and it's not a, an issue with remote desktop logging out of the PC with remote desktop. There's, it, it turns out it's all based on a temperature sensitivity that I have, and everything worked fine once I bypassed the mini PC and went back to my USB cable. The thing I'm going to do is to buy a heating pad that I will put in that box I showed you and essentially wrap it around the mini PC to try to keep it warm and who knows maybe I'll give it a teddy bear as well but I'm going to keep that USB cable handy just in case. Well I did actually get some useful data I did learn some valuable lessons and I think I have a smoking gun for the problems that I was having. My fingers are crossed and I'll give it a try again. Okay, guys, well, that's all I have for today. I'll talk to you later. Clear skies. See ya.